Hello and welcome to the Capitol Report. I'm your host, Steve Lance. Here's a look at some of the stories we've been covering for you today. The deadline the Biden administration set for August 31st to exit Afghanistan is approaching, and as the situation there becomes more chaotic, some congressmen who served in the war-torn country held an emotional press conference. The House is taking up a few substantial bills this week, a new voting rights bill and the massive $3.5 trillion budget bill that's packed with a variety of new social welfare programs. During her first trip to Asia, Vice President Kamala Harris blamed Beijing for endangering peace in the contested region. As the crisis in Afghanistan becomes more urgent and the situation on the ground continues to be volatile, President Biden sent the head of the CIA to meet with the Taliban. Reports are saying that this was to negotiate a peaceful exit for the remaining Americans inside of the country. On Tuesday, a group of Republican congressmen, many of whom were combat veterans in Afghanistan, held a press conference and expressed their frustration with how the exit has been executed. Brian Mast was injured in Afghanistan September 19th, 2010. Had countless friends, killed in action to my left and right. Recovered alongside hundreds more, had the honor of serving alongside hundreds of thousands that, that put on the uniform. Uh, about 85% of the people who live at Fort Campbell are in my district. When I go to the Publix, I have to look into the eyes of children who are gold star children. This is deeply personal for me. Meanwhile, House Democrats are saying they want to extend the evacuation That's mission in Afghanistan. Right. They want Biden to extend the mission past the August 31st deadline to make sure everyone is rescued. But so far, President Biden is sticking to August 31st. I think it is critically important we ensure our military has the tools it needs to complete the mission. I do not believe that this can be accomplished by August 31st, and I've requested that the SECDEF and SEC State encourage the president in the strongest possible terms to reconsider that deadline. One of the biggest points of concern from the members of Congress was how much United States military weaponry has made its way into the hands of the Taliban because of the exit strategy. Minority Leader Kevin McCarthy said there are reports that the Taliban now has more Black Hawk helicopters than the country of Australia, including American night vision optics, body armor, and a host of other weapons. With many Americans still unable to evacuate Afghanistan and the Biden administration's final withdrawal date of August 31st looking very unlikely, we asked Texas Congressman Chip Roy about how he sees this situation playing out. We also asked him about his thoughts on the recent FDA approval of the Pfizer vaccine. Where do you think we are heading right now in Afghanistan? Um, you have the Taliban who has now, you know, taken over control. They've been known to harbor terrorists, Al-Qaeda, um, ISIS. Are we go going to wind up having to have more of a presence than we initially did in these waning months now that they are going to be potentially harboring these terrorist groups? Well, one thing for sure about Afghanistan is that it has been handled uh, worse than you could possibly have ever believed by an American president. Uh, we are in greater danger. Our, our men and women in uniform are left wondering what happened. Uh, Americans are in danger. We have assets that are now being used by our enemies. And so now the odds of our having to continue to engage in combat live operations in Afghanistan and in the region are much greater than they were two weeks ago, three weeks ago, four weeks ago. The Biden administration could set an arbitrary deadline, pick a date, and then just force us out in a complete cluster like they've done and think they can walk away, but they can't. This is a world that's going to be ongoing. And so now the Taliban's there, we've got Al-Qaeda, we know that they're still continuing to operate with and, and harbor Al-Qaeda. And what, what was an effort by the previous administration to draw down and come up with a plan for a coalition government or try to hold Afghanistan accountable with a reduced footprint by our military to be able to sort of set the stage for the future, that was all upended, dumped on its head with an arbitrary uh, exit from Afghanistan. And now we're paying the price. Look, I, I also need to say one thing. Congress needs to look in the mirror. We've been operating under a 20-year off authorization of the use of military force coming up in October. That's wrong. Congress on both sides of the aisle, Republicans and Democrats, we have failed to do our duty to pass an updated authorization of force to make clear to the American people, to our military and to the world, why we're there, what we're trying to do, and, why, and what we expect to uh, have the conclusion be. And so Congress should speak clearly 
about what our presence is uh, in the future, uh, whether it's in Afghanistan, whether it's in Iraq or any part of that region or anywhere else in the world, and not allow a president to have this kind of leeway to make this bad of a decision. Article 1 is in there to declare war for a reason. Congress ought to act like it. We're going to point fingers at Biden, and we should. It's a total disaster what this guy's done to the country and to the world and to our men and women in uniform uh, and to the people of Afghanistan and empowering Taliban. Uh, but Congress needs to look in the mirror and, and, and do their part. So I just wanted to ask you, the um, FDA has just recently approved the vaccine. From your perspective, is it normal for this type of a vaccine, any vaccine, to be expedited and pushed this quickly? Well, it sure uh, not met, does not meet with my experience in life. Ten years ago this month, I was um, uh, in the midst of using a drug that was at that point FDA approved for cancer relapse patients, and I was, I was in a trial for new patients. Uh, that drug went on to save my life. Um, but I would tell you that the FDA typically stands in the way of drug access more than it does actually help. Helps, right? That's why we support Right to Try. We believe Americans ought to be able to get access to drugs when the market produces something and be able to go consult with their doctor and to go figure out what's best for them and their families. My dad had polio in 1949. Uh, I very much understand and, and appreciate how vaccines are very beneficial to my kids and me. We took polio vaccine. Uh, but the American people ought to be able to decide. You know, we're seven, eight months into this. Uh, we've got 71, 72 percent of, of 12 and up Americans have taken one shot of the vaccine. Uh, we're seeing I think some benefits from that. I think there are obviously ongoing concerns that some people have and they ought to be able to make those decisions consulting their doctor. Well, look, I think what we're seeing here is a lot of political pressure to try to push this vaccine for the sake of it rather than going through, following the science, doing all the things you need to do to, to conduct thorough research. Uh, look at the efficacy. Look at what's going on in Israel. Go look at what's happening, as you said, with the uh, heart issues that we've seen uh, raised. Go look at all the different anecdotes that you hear from different people. Meanwhile, do recognize that, you know, my dad's 78 years old, my mom's 72. When you look at the risk profile there with respect to getting uh, COVID uh, and, you know, balancing that, they chose to get the vaccine. Congressman Chip Roy, thank you. Thanks, sir. This week on Capitol Hill, the House is taking up a variety of high profile bills. A new voting rights bill and the massive $3.5 trillion budget bill that's packed with a variety of new social welfare programs. Our reporter Melina Wisecup has the latest details for us. We know some moderate Democrats have been pushing back on passing that massive budget bill. What's the latest? Steve, this $3.5 trillion massive spending bill is to pay for social welfare programs like affordable housing, free community college, universal pre-K, and other initiatives. It has already passed the Senate, but on Tuesday it passed the House as well. That's despite pushback, days-long pushback, from some moderate Democrats who threatened to tank this bill if they didn't get that smaller hard infrastructure bill first. Some of those moderate Democrats led by Representative Gottheimer said, quote, there is a standoff with some of our colleagues who have decided to hold the infrastructure bill hostage for months or kill it altogether if they don't get what they want in the next bill, a largely undefined $3.5 trillion reconciliation package. And those moderate Democrats, Steve, were very against this massive spending bill, saying that they're concerned about the overall cost of this bill. They're concerned about the implications this would have on taxpayers and where they would get the money to pay for this. But they just were simply pleading with Speaker Pelosi to hold to, to go ahead and pass that bipartisan hard infrastructure bill before passing this budget bill. However, it looks that it looks like those moderate Democrats have folded and made a deal with Speaker Pelosi, Steve. So, Melina, what are you hearing about the separate one trillion dollar bill for the hard infrastructure? We know the Senate passed that earlier this month and just needs to pass the House so that Biden can sign it into law. Will the House pass this anytime soon? Well, Steve, it looks like from the deal that those moderate Democrats made with Speaker Pelosi, this smaller, hard infrastructure bill won't be passed in the House until late September. So essentially what happened is progressives got their way. Speaker Pelosi convinced those moderate Democrats to jump on board. The House has advanced that massive $3.5 trillion budget bill, and they're pushing that hard infrastructure bill to later on next month, Steve. Thanks for that, Melina. And the House this week passed a new voting rights bill. Moving on to another bill in the House right now. 
This one, H.R. 4, is similar to H.R. 1, the For the People Act, which already passed the House, but was blocked in the Senate when met with Republican opposition. Some House Republicans have knocked down this new voting rights bill, saying it's an unconstitutional government overreach. We hear from a legal fellow at the Heritage Foundation to learn more about it. The second attempt to pass a voting rights bill initiated by House Democrats is an effort to give federal government more control over state and local elections. Democrats supporting the bill say this is necessary in order to combat voter discrimination among minority groups. We need federal oversight. Yes. If it wasn't for federal oversight, we not only would not have gotten the Voting Rights Act, we wouldn't have gotten the Civil Rights Act. That's right, that's right. In this new voter bill is another attempt to expand mail-in voting, legalize ballot harvesting, ban voter ID throughout the nation, and use American tax dollars to fund congressional campaigns. It would essentially uh, require preclearance, uh, require state and local governments to get uh, permission from the Department of Justice in Washington, D.C., before they enacted a, a whole host of even minor changes to their election rules and processes. Not only are they unelected and unaccountable to the voters, uh, but they tend to, to draw the lawyers in that section uh, from left-leaning advocacy groups. And unfortunately, those lawyers uh, appear to want to continue their advocacy work at the Department of Justice. H.R. 4 goes even further, negating two Supreme Court election law decisions. The first, Brnovich versus Democratic National Committee, which was earlier this year. Arizona won, with the Supreme Court upholding Arizona's right to ban vote harvesting. H.R. 4 would undo that. It also aims to strengthen the Voting Rights Act of 1965. Old battles have become new again. A voter ID has been declared uh, a uh, provision that can dilute the vote. But in 2013, the Supreme Court ruled that this was no longer an issue and that the federal government doesn't need to step in to prevent voter discrimination since voter discrimination is no longer deemed as a threat like it was in the 1960s. That formula was originally enacted in 1965 based on uh, voter turnout data, voter registration data uh, from 1965, which is vastly different uh, from what the situation on the ground is today. Smith says this is proven by looking at the voter census data, where voter turnout among minorities has progressed sharply upwards over the years, especially between 2014 and 2018, as shown in this Pew Research chart. Reporting in Washington, D.C., Melina Weisskopf, NTD News. Territorial conflict in the South China Sea has been a regional flashpoint for years. U.S. Vice President Kamala Harris spoke in Singapore Tuesday. She blamed Beijing for endangering peace in the contested region. We know that Beijing continues to coerce, to intimidate, and to make claims to the vast majority of the South China Sea. In a speech on Tuesday, Vice President Kamala Harris accused Beijing of coercion and intimidation tactics in the South China Sea dispute. She made the comment while visiting Singapore, the first stop on her Southeast Asia trip. Harris called China's claims in the disputed waters unlawful. And Beijing's actions continue to undermine the rules-based order and threaten the sovereignty of nations. The United States stands with our allies and partners in the face of these threats. In recent years, China has been rapidly building up its military presence to support its claims in the region. Harris sought to reassure America's allies in the Indo-Pacific. Harris's flight was delayed for nearly three hours on Tuesday when she left Singapore for Vietnam due to a possible case of Havana syndrome among two of her staffers in Hanoi. This is a neurological issue recently appearing among U.S. diplomats with unclear origins. Kathy Hochul has been sworn in as the 57th governor of New York, replacing former Governor Andrew Cuomo. Cuomo stepped down in the face of sexual harassment allegations. Chief Judge Janet DeFiore presided over a brief private ceremony in the New York State Capitol at midnight on Tuesday. Hochul became the first female governor in New York State's history. She promised a fresh, collaborative approach in state government at another ceremonial swearing in on Tuesday morning. Uh, we also talked about how we'll be combating COVID, getting direct aid to New Yorkers more quickly, 
and changing the culture of Albany. And that's why I'm looking forward to a fresh collaborative approach. Cuomo left office at 11.59 p.m. on Monday. New York Attorney General Letitia James released a report concluding there was credible evidence he had sexually harassed at least 11 women. In wake of CDC's reporting, effectiveness of the vaccines is starting to wane. The FDA has approved the Pfizer vaccine, but many still have questions about long-term side effects. And new home sales rose 1% in July as new home prices soared to record levels. The median price of a new home sold in July climbed to over $390,000. And over 100,000 patients in America are waiting for an organ transplant. People around the world have been traveling to China to seek expedited transplant surgery. Multiple investigations have found that this speedy turnaround is coming at the cost of innocent lives. Hundreds of people in Texas and California, including many parents and doctors, took a stand against vaccine mandates over the weekend. Hundreds of rally goers showed up this past Saturday in Texas. Multiple speakers touched on a variety of issues related to vaccine mandates. A father said that the vaccine killed his son. My son received the vaccine and he died a few days later. The only explanation that was given to me was a large heart. So if I have anything to say to anybody, look down at your child. It's not worth the risk. I mean, you see your baby right now, you might not see your baby tomorrow. I have to live with that the rest of my life. I love the hell out of my country, but I don't trust my government anymore. Medical doctors shared the success in treating COVID patients using FDA approved therapeutics. As of this week, my practice has treated approximately 1,200 acutely ill patients as old as 98 years old. On the same day in California, dozens of medical workers protested against vaccine mandates in hospitals. Vaccine effectiveness is waning against the Delta variant, according to CDC Director Rochelle Walensky, and many Americans are still being forced to take the shot or risk losing employment. Here to discuss with us is attorney and director of strategy at America's Frontline Doctors, Joey Gilbert. Joey, thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. Joey, one of the biggest concerns I've been hearing about is the reluctancy to take the vaccine because of the long-term health side effects. Many people in positions of authority have been downplaying these concerns, considering that it usually takes about six to nine months for long-term side effects to start to surface, hence the term long term. Do you think these people have a fair argument to want to wait? A fair argument? I mean, come on. This thing has no long term studies. They don't even have a control group. They purposely lost the control group from Moderna and Pfizer. How this thing got approved is beyond me. Hey, this is absolute insanity. We've never had a vaccine go like this right here in front of me. I have the uh, yellow fever, polio, measles, HSV, influenza, 35 years for yellow fever, polio, 45 years, measles, 46 years, hepatitis V took 17, this is years it took to get the vaccine. Influenza was 1933 to 1945, that was 12 years. And then the flu's not gone, by the way. Um, HPV, uh, 1974 to 2007, 33 years. HIV, they started to work on in 1983. That's 38 years, there's still no vaccine. COVID-19, 2019 to 2020, six months. Six months. So there's no long-term studies. There's no control group. No one knows what this thing is going to do long-term. It was never studied fully on humans, never studied fully on children, and they're trying to put this in 12 years and older. It's insane. It's out, this is a common sense thing. This is not an, I'm vaccinated. I've got every vaccine that we've ever had to have, but I'm not about an experimental medical protocol with no long-term studies. Every single person with a brain should be worried that there's no long-term long -term studies on this. It's simple, it's simple math. It's simple, simple common sense for something with a 99.9% .9 survivability rating for most people. It's only until you get up to the 75 and older pre-existing conditions do you see to start to drive to a 95, but that's still 95%. So you have more chance of getting hit with a coconut 
walking underneath a tree, a coconut tree, than you do, you know, this, this, you know, something else killing you, let alone COVID-19. So everyone should be concerned about this. There's no place for it in America. There's no place for it in, 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 in this world that we're mandating an unproven experimental therapy that doesn't prevent transmission, doesn't prevent infection. And I'm sorry, I just got a, a, an update out of the 80, 80 people that died in Vegas over the last week and a half, 55 of them were vaccinated. So it's not even preventing death. And again, these are hospital numbers and public data, so you know it's completely different. It's, I'd probably put that up near 70%, or 70 of the 80 probably were vaccinated. So again, this is scary. Everybody should be scared and everybody should hold the line. Joey, when it comes to naturally acquired immunity, those who have already had the virus, but yet still are being required to take the vaccines, even though their body can technically fight the virus off equally, if not better than if they were vaccinated, according to the medical community's own assessment, do you see any long-term legal trouble for these companies forcing the vaccines on their employees if there turns out to be adverse effects? Absolutely. When this is all said and done and shakes out, they're going to get sued back to the Stone Age. Let me tell you something, man. I don't care whether they prove this thing or not. You're forcing people to get this with no long-term studies, and you're going to put yourself in a bad spot. And I think I, I would caution everybody to hold the line, especially if you had it. I had it. I am healthier and you know, I'm 40 times you know, stronger. That's a John Hopkins, you know, you know there's a first time in, in medical history or the history of this country where we've got board certified Ivy League trained physicians saying that you can't, you know, that, that you're stronger or better off by having, you know, contracted this nat and de developed natural immunity. And now they're saying that you, you still need to get the vaccine. They're contradicting science or contradicting settled science with emotions and fear-based nonsense. What is really in this thing, because it's not about science. It's not about preventing COVID. It's not about preventing people, you know, a public health emergency because you can still transmit it. And according to Anthony Fauci, the nasal teeters, the viral load in those that have been vaccinated is stronger, stronger than those that have not been vaccinated. Well, that comes right down to antibody, you know, dependent enhancement. It goes right down with everything we already knew about this, that again, you're, you're killing, you're, you're, you're destroying the natural antibodies and you're destroying the broad spectrum antibodies that your body produces. So yes, you're going to have more of a viral load in those that were vaccinated, which means they just don't have the same symptoms, but they're just as much transmitting it and being super spreaders than anybody else. Joey Gilbert, attorney with America's Frontline Doctors. Thank you. Thank you. And director of the NIH, Francis Collins, said on Tuesday that he didn't see the approval for kids between the ages of 5 and 11 coming much before the end of 2021. NASA is delaying a spacewalk at the International Space Station this week because of an undisclosed medical issue involving one of its astronauts. Less than 24 hours before the astronaut was supposed to float outside, NASA officials postponed the event. Officials said in a statement on Monday the astronaut is dealing with a minor medical issue. They noted it's not an emergency, but didn't provide any further details. According to NASA, the spacewalk will be rescheduled within the coming days. Sales of new homes rose a modest 1% in July as new home prices soar to record levels. New home sales had fallen in April, May, and June as builders confronted surging lumber prices and a shortage of workers. The Commerce Department reported Tuesday sales in July reached a seasonally adjusted annual rate of 708000 The median price of a new home sold in July climbed to new highs over $390,000, up close to 20% from a year ago while the average sales price in July hit a record $446,000, up over 17% from a year ago. According to the House Subcommittee on Economic and Consumer Policy, over 100,000 patients in America are waiting for an organ transplant. It's estimated that 33 people in the U.S. die every day while waiting for a transplant. People around the world have been traveling to China to seek expedited transplant surgery after learning that they could acquire an organ in just one or two weeks. Multiple investigations have found that this speedy turnaround is coming at the cost of innocent lives. 
Recently, dozens of resolutions have been passed at state, county, and city levels, warning residents not to take part in transplant tourism, a practice where people will travel to foreign countries for expedited transplants. In many cases, these shorter wait periods come at a great cost for the unwilling donors. In June, a resolution unanimously passed in Texas through both chambers of the state legislature. It states, in doing so, they may be unwittingly becoming involved in murder in the form of forced organ harvesting. Texas state lawmakers condemned the Chinese communist regime's systematic killing of prisoners of conscience for their organs. Hopefully, this resolution will say to the medical community, tell your patients this is wrong because I think patients unknowingly become a partner with the murdering of innocent people. Since January, 18 counties or cities in Virginia have passed resolutions to inform the residents about forced organ harvesting in China. They wish to raise awareness and to stop local residents from engaging in organ transplant tourism in the communist nation. The story, which is almost too hard to believe, was first revealed in March 2006 in Washington, D.C. A woman claimed that as many as 4,000 Falun Gong practitioners had been killed for their organs at the hospital in which she had worked. Falun Gong is a spiritual discipline rooted in Chinese culture based on the principles of truthfulness, compassion, and forbearance. The Communist Party outlawed the practice in 1999 because of its rising popularity among citizens and Communist Party members. The whistleblower also said that her husband, a surgeon at the same hospital just outside the city of Shenyang in northeastern China, had disclosed to her that he had removed corneas from the living bodies of 2,000 Falun Gong practitioners. One week later, a Chinese military doctor not only corroborated the woman's account, but claimed that such atrocities were taking place in 36 different forced labor camps throughout China. The largest, he said, held 120,000 people. In July 2006, former Canadian Secretary of State for Asia Pacific Affairs David Kilgore and human rights attorney David Mattis published a 140-page report which drew the regrettable conclusion that the allegations of forced live organ harvesting are indeed true. Transplant numbers in China shot up shortly after the persecution of Falun Gong began in 1999. There's only one country in the world out of, I believe, 196 now where the government runs this, uh, this uh, trafficking, and there are no survivors in China. All of the donors in China have basically have all of their organs taken and then their bodies are burned. In June of 2016, the United States House of Representatives unanimously passed House Resolution 343, which calls on China's communist regime to immediately stop forced organ harvesting from Falun Gong practitioners and other prisoners of conscience. In early March of this year, lawmakers from both parties reintroduced legislation in the Senate and the House to stop China's state-sanctioned practice of forced organ harvesting from prisoners of conscience. It's time that we take bold, uh, a bold stance uh, against the communist, uh, Chinese Communist Party and hold it accountable for these inhumane atrocities. The meditation discipline Falun Gong was widely popular in China during the 1990s. By state estimates, 70 to 100 million people were practicing this meditation practice as of 1999. Despite the peaceful nature of the practice, in July of that year, the Chinese regime, believing its power was threatened by such popularity, launched a nationwide crackdown designed to eradicate the faith. Practitioners of Falun Gong have since faced detention, physical torture, and forced live organ harvesting. Last month, thousands of Falun Gong practitioners held a candlelight vigil in front of the Washington Monument in memory of those tortured to death over the past 22 years at the hands of the Chinese Communist Party. And that's all for today's Capitol Report. Thank you for joining us, and please don't forget to like and subscribe below. I'm your host, Steve Lance. We'll see you next time.